messages. And um, what happens is we have chemicals that, that activate those nerves. And so that's what this picture is. It's the two little ends of nerves talking to each other and the stuff in between is the chemicals. And, and so some of those are um, opioids floating around and they're opioid receptors in the ends of those. And so what happens is when the opioid receptors are filled with an opioid or other kind of drug that can also activate them, we feel good, calm, secure, loved, okay? And so from birth, our bodies produce those opioids. We naturally produce those in our bodies and, and that fills our receptors. And so those that naturally occur in our bodies are called endogenous opioids. Um, and so animals and humans are built with the receptors. They're built with the capacity to release those endogenous opioids um, and interaction with a caregiver. Um, so like mother, baby, mama, rat, baby, rat, rats become important in a few minutes um, um, or whatever species it is. And so that that naturally happens as mothers and babies bond and so forth. And so they're activating those receptors and that is and it happens in both the mom. The mom releases those. The baby releases those. Everybody feels good. We're in love. Uh, same thing happens when you fall in love as an adult. The same thing happens when you laugh at a funny movie with your friends, uh, um, when you run a marathon. I don't know. That wouldn't be so happy to me, but um, <laughs> that would be me lying on the sidewalk. But um, but those same sorts of, of chemicals are released. All right. And so, but they're also exogenous opioids or other kinds of drugs, but other things from outside your body that activate those receptors. And so that could be pain pills. It could be heroin. It could be fentanyl. It could be meth. It could be lots of different <clears throat> kinds of substances outside your body that then activate those receptors. Um, and so that becomes important because one of the things that we know is if you have those external substances coming in and activating those receptors, your body says, oh, I don't need to make those anymore. And so your own system will shut down. Therein lies our problem, which we will get into. <clears throat> so now kind of how we know the system works, let's talk about how that might look differently in different childhood scenarios. So if someone has nurturing relationships, they feel safe, um, <clears throat> their, their systems are working as they should, um, their receptors are filled. And so even if they are, you know, experience the use of a drug or something later, they may be far less likely to become dependent on that substance because they already, their system is already working. And so they're not feeling anything different. However, if someone who has been consistently neglected, say if their parent also used substances and neglected them, or if, um, if they suffer from mental illness or something like that, and for whatever reason, the child is neglected or they're gone from foster home to foster home, they have hungry receptors. They have not been being filled with those naturally occurring receptors. <clears throat> and so when they do experience, you know, it's, what we'll see sometimes is somebody will describe that is addicted to, to say opioids. They say, the first time I used it, I felt like I want to feel forever. I felt love like I had never felt before. And it's like I, a warm blanket. There are all these descriptions that sound like I just got hugged by my mom and that's normal, you know, but, but somebody that's never experienced that, it might be a very milestone experience for them. And so one of the things I want to talk about here is this, uh, and this is kind of the, the aha moment with lots of people to hear about this study that was done in the 70s um, by a researcher named Panksepp. And what he did was he had little baby rats. I told you rats, rats would become important. And so they were studying how mama, mama rats and baby rats interact. And what happens when you take a baby rat away from the mama, the baby will cry. Duh. Um, it will, it will, it will squeal for the mom unless you give it an opioid. And the moment you give it the opioid, doesn't cry, doesn't care, doesn't need mom anymore because they're feeling that mama feel apparently. And so this is what first started making people think, oh, this is filling that same, that same um, receptor and having that same effect. And so um, what we're thinking is that. Uh, um, that that temporary filling meets that need, it, it, it thwarts the connection or replaces the connection or whatever, 
Um, but if we've got those, if you've got somebody that for whatever reason, and I'm not going to say that it's only with people that have adversity, we know some people get addicted very just because they had a surgery and they began taking um, opioids for pain after the surgery um, that still can replace their endogenous opioids. And so they become dependent on that exogenous one. And if you remove it, it's very painful. It's very painful and, and like ridiculously painful. And so, so it's hard to stop using it regardless of how you became addicted. We're just saying that it's much more likely in, in people that perhaps um, experienced that adversity earlier. So this brings me to what we do now, because we, we said a while ago in the pictures you saw, we have the, ovio, the overdose death rate is going up. The number of people becoming addicted is going up. The number of um, babies born drug exposed going up. It's just it, whatever we're doing is not working. Um, but I'll, I'll get there in a second. So the current uh, th current treatment, and I don't want to bash treatment. I, I, treatment. Treatment keeps people alive, but I want them to be even better. Um, so current treatment is largely medical. And so we just said it's a chronic relapsing brain disease. Therefore, we treat it with a medication. And so we have treatment medications. And so what is typically used is safer versions of opioids. So we've got methadone, uh, we've got buprenorphine, and then we've got a, a blocker called naltrexone or Vivitrol. And so I want to talk a minute about those because methadone is a, we have some that Fully, fully fill your opioid receptor. So methadone is a full agonist opioid, which means it completely fills it. So it acts very much like um, heroin, except that it's longer acting and it's in a very controlled environment, how you receive that. Then we have buprenorphine, which is a partial agonist. It partially activates those receptors. Um, and that is given by prescription where you take it on your own. You, you get it, you fill it at the pharmacy and you, and you dispense it to yourself. Um, and then Vivitrol actually blocks the ability of the opioid receptor to have an opioid um, attached to it um, and activate it. And so um, they're much safer because you are far less likely to die of an overdose. But um, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so right now, this is the, looks very similar to the Matt Mary Jo shared a while ago. Um, and it makes sense that lots of the treatment is happening where lots of the drug use and overdose deaths are happening. So I'm not saying, you know, we're causing it here. Now, I will say, side note, we do know that most of our NAS right now is due to prescribed buprenorphine. So that one absolutely is a we're causing that, which is an issue, which we'll talk about in some other webinar some other time. But this is our prescribing rate. So we have a very high treatment rate. So, so it's not that people are not getting access to treatment. It's that something about that treatment is probably not answering the question that we wanted to answer. Um, because if you look then, we've got the um, um, adjusted death rate for our area. People are still dying. There, you know, it's, it's like we have a lot of treatment, but we still have a lot of death. So we need to do something different. All right. So it seems like um, if we could somehow get at the root of the issue rather than rather than treating the symptoms. Um, oh, and let me, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so what we're proposing is from the get-go back, way back there was what if, what if um, connecting with people, if we could reconnect people with folks and, and restart that system, um, what we want to do is when we know, we know that when um, the opioid receptors are activated or blocked, um, that it turns off our production, all right? And so some very recent research, and we're talking connection as a way to treat this, but one of the things that we have learned from some very recent research is that all of those treatment medications, either the the methadone or the buprenorphine or even the naltrexone, which doesn't cause any effect of the opioid, it just blocks the ability of that receptor to activate, prevent interpersonal connection. So, so we're saying, okay, we've got this potential treatment, but the other kind of treatment is making it not work. And so this is this is a this is a sticking point right now. Um, and so um, what we want to investigate 
is whether um, we can increase interpersonal connection at a dose that can replace the need for external or exogenous opioids. Um, that is that is kind of where we're going. And so um, one of the, uh, I was gonna let Mary Jo kind of sum up where we are. And then we're gonna talk about some ways we're actually trying to tackle this to see if we can do it. And then, um, so so you, you go yeah. for our summary right now. Okay, awesome. So uh, a symbol that we always return back to when we're doing this work is the visual of an iceberg. Like we see the surface level, we see overdose, we see um, opioid prescription rates higher, we see more neonatal abstinence syndrome. However, there is so much more going on under the surface. And so that may be that under the surface, children haven't had a loving caregiver that has um, filled those endogenous opioid receptors naturally. So maybe people, you know, because of their adverse health experiences, have this kind of down regulated. So they have less opioids in their body, and thus they're going to seek out those substances that will replace their mother's love, if we want to say that. <laughs> um, so we think that neglected or abused children are likely going to um, seek out those substances that will naturally fill. And that's the self-medication hypothesis. And I'm sure a lot of people have heard that, you know, you seek it out because you have something that might be deficient. And so we propose that by coming into relationship with people very, very intentionally, and fostering those strong relationships, we can actually help people to kind of create those endogenous opioids all over again. So they didn't have enough, so they sought out substances, and now they're in recovery or they're not even in recovery, and we want to help them bring in those opioids themselves not have to take something externally, but be able to replicate that safe relationship later in life and fill those endogenous opioid receptors themselves through that interpersonal loving relationship. So Andy, I hope that's a good yeah. summary for so you. Now we, yeah, so now we, we, we're just gonna bat it back and forth because we haven't really said who's talking what here, but I wanna tell you a little bit about what we're trying to do. And so now, that's you, you've heard all of my research brain and what we're doing, but I also run a nonprofit called Uplift Appalachia. And what we are actually trying to do is create wraparound care, what we call wraparound care for people who are, I mean, this should work for preventing use also, but what we're doing right now is trying to partner with the treatment community and the um, recovery communities and such to, to match them and what, Right now, we're using we're trying to mobilize the faith community. We'll we'll mobilize any community that will wrap around people. But that's what right now we're doing most most of our training in the faith community. But the purpose is to intentionally increase interpersonal connection in order to um, to hopefully restart people's endogenous opioid systems and make them not need drugs. Um, <clears throat> but when we say that, um, the the intentional part is and one of the reasons we looked to the faith community is because when you have somebody that is um, um, misusing substances that becomes the thing that they love and it is and i say love but it's like they're compelled to continue getting that and that's the thing they protect just like a loved one and so forth and so they're not going to be most likely seeking a relationship with you so it's got to be somebody that really selflessly pursues them to create a relationship um, and hopefully eventually that becomes rewarding enough that they are reciprocal but it's got to be somebody that's going to quite altruistically want to do this thing for the good of the other person because it's not going to be very reciprocal to start with and so I want to I want to describe um, a program that we're working on just to give you an idea how this might look, but then I want to leave a good bit of time so that you can ask us questions or whatever, because it's much more fun to have a conversation and answer questions about it. But I, I have to have to give you sort of the pitch first. So we have this thing we call Uplift Rides. And this um, was birthed over a lunch a few years ago where we had we realized 
we had uh, we had planted a small church in a really high need area, had a lot of high need people, and sort of looked back how serendipitously we had been about half of the church was giving about the other half of church rides because the other half of the church were were using substances or were homeless or whatever, and for whatever reason they had no transportation, and so we saw that the people who got the rides got better and stayed better. And the people who were giving the rides became very compassionate and non-judgmental toward the people who were getting the rides. And it's like, wow, that just happened. That might be a thing. <laughs> and, so, and so it started us on this road to, on this road, ha ha. <laughs> we do say that, that, that connection is the vehicle to recovery. Um, <laughs> but we said, what if we could do that on purpose and use rides, get people that will give people rides, which we know that transportation is a huge barrier to recovery. To it's a it's a social determinant of health. It's it predicts all kinds of good or bad things. If you don't have it, predicts bad things. If you have the transportation, it predicts good things. Getting to work, getting to doctor's appointments, getting to court, so you don't violate probation and go back to jail. All of these things. Um, so we said, what if we get this this loving altruistic group of folks that will just give people rides, and as they give people rides develop relationships with them because you've got sort of a captive audience there in your car um, because they've got to get somewhere. You put them in the front seat, not the back seat like an Uber, not a van full of people, but just a friend giving a friend a ride and over time sort of become a confidant, become a friend of the person. It also may um, be an inroad to the person being incorporated into a healthier community. Um, and but you also have somebody that's going to support you say give the example of i'm going to give you a ride to recovery meeting or whatever and then one week you say i'm not going to the meeting you say well why aren't you going to the meeting and it's like ah, i just don't feel like it and like, well, what if i pick you up and we'll go get coffee and then maybe you get to the meeting maybe you just have coffee but you've got that accountability of somebody pursuing you because they care about your good um and but that relationship is developing and over time hopefully that will help you to, you know, pursue and, and and maybe you don't have a license and through that, maybe eventually you get your license or maybe you are able to get to employment and through the employment, then you can get a car and, you know, all, all of these things. And so where we are right now is we're doing a lot of equipping and training and pitching the idea and so forth. And, um, and so um, I'll just tell you really good news on Monday from two different directions, the idea got funded by the opioid abatement grants. Um, so one is for the equipping and one is for the, the getting drivers. So um, yeah, so people have been listening apparently over, over time, but that's, that's one application of this. It doesn't have to look like that, but that is one pretty easy application that's tangible. And it, does, it doesn't have to be church people. It could be anybody, it could be you know, the Rotary Club decides we're going to do rides for people, whatever. Um, so, uh, but but any time where it is that developing that, that relationship um, and as Uplift, we would like to help equip people. And what we do when we equip people is we um, we do like a, no, a, a non-negotiable is doing trauma-informed care training. It's like, you've got to have that as a foundation. And then what we call Addiction 101, which is kind of the, yeah, this is how the drug works, but as much more, this is what the economy of someone's life looks like. This is the the challenges they have. This is avoiding manipulation, understanding the legal system, understanding the draw of the the drugs and so forth, so that so that somebody knows what they're getting into and they're going in. So they're going to do more good than harm, not not make it worse and so forth. And then we do coaching for people that that decide to to tackle this. We are glad to to go alongside people. What 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 have I left out, Mary Jo? You you are in this world with me, so you may not know what I've left out. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that I think that you addressed that all really well. But I I want to return back to kind of the the central thesis, and I've gotten a couple of um, questions in the chat about that endogenous opioid system. Um, so really, what the goal of this interpersonal relationship with it can happen across the lifespan, someone at various stages in their recovery. It could be like a bunch of the kiddos that I um, interact with where they're exposed through their parents and that wasn't their 
their choice to use in the first place. Um, but using that strong interpersonal connection can still really um, make a difference in a person's life by um, teaching the brain how to introduce its own opioids again in the absence of others. And so one of the questions that I got is, can we please repeat why medication for opioid use disorder does not help in this respect? Is it the type of opioid receptor it binds to? It, does, so, it, does, it does help. It does. I mean, I, I will say I am not a get rid of it. It is a tool in the toolbox. Absolutely. People stay alive because they have controlled and they're in a treatment program. And so I am not not advocating throwing that out. I'm just saying. <clears throat> and sometimes people will, and people there are people that function on it fine. And I don't want to mess with that because there are some people that it's like life is working. Let's not mess it up. But there are some people <clears throat> that life is not working and that and and there are some people that just want to be free of substances and completely. Um, and what I was saying is that um, the the more recent research has shown when you look at that ability to connect with people and seek connection and create relationships, it is dampened by the medications. Um, and so that that's the the thing that it might be. Um, if we're if we're trying to increase connection, it might be working at cross purposes to that. And so that's something that you have to consider and weigh it out and pros and cons of both. And um, the thing is, if you if you don't have people that are walking with you, caring with you, connecting with you, I would say it's much safer to be on medication. If you try to get off the medication, you want the people that are walking with you close to you that that are um caring for you we call it swaddling where we just wrap around you and don't let you go you know um <laughs> so so that's that's where those are and so it does what it does is it does kind of activate or block those receptors that that feel that love and so that's that's what we have to know and as far as can we restart that system um that's the research we want to do it hasn't been done yet you know and so you don't know until you do it um and so, um, and you can't do it with rats because I don't know if you know this, they're just very, not very altruistic. Um, they don't seek out the good of others. They eat the food themselves or whatever. So, so it's like, it's pretty much got to be humans that does this. Um, and so that's some of the, the follow-up research that we want to have. Now we do know from, from like um, um, recovery communities, AA, NA, those kinds of things that they are very much community connection and so forth and they we know they are very effective so as far as looking at do they predict each other yes they do but we haven't done the let's follow this and see we're trying to do that but we haven't done the let's follow this and see if we change this thing you know does that does that cause you to have those increased opioids does that does it kind of answer what was asked yeah, I think it I think it addresses it. And I think that that's really important to note. It is a tool and it can be helpful and people can still absolutely be on medications to treatment and have rewarding social relationships. It can just sometimes be a barrier um, because it kind of does block those kind of receptors that provide that social reward. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's I think that's a really good way to address it. We have more questions. Do you mind if I Go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're open. This is it's, awesome. it's like everybody's fair game now. Okay, so <laughs> you guys can put your questions in the chat, and we will discuss them, or you can even unmute yourself and talk if you want to. Um, but I'll go ahead and read this question from Elizabeth. Um, so, will endogenous opioids rise and help someone who's on Vivitrol if they increase interpersonal connection, or does it prevent it entirely? Um, so that kind of goes back to what we just. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I I have read the literature where people did study Vivitrol and it was people connected better without it than with it, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Jury's yeah. out. So, yeah. Research needs so, to be done. There's a little bit of evidence to say that it does like some barrier to social connection, but it's still possible. So yeah, that's awesome. Okay. And then um, Janie asks, is there a way like lab work or testing that can test the levels of endogenous opioids? This is a good question. There is, but I don't know how to do it. Um, yes, people, there are people who do that. And, and with adequate funding, we would be able to do such a thing. But yeah, that has not even been on the radar yet. Um, but I continue making the case because somebody should, I don't have to do it. Somebody needs to be doing that. Yes. But yes, you can test for that. Yes. 
Any other questions that people have for us? What's the process of testing? I don't know. <laughs> so I can speak a little bit to this. I have done um, a couple of deep dives on this. And what we see is it usually requires a blood test um, from what I can see and the research that I've done. Um, and so it is slightly invasive. And so I think that might be one reason why it's not super widely used. Um, but yeah, so that it, it involves a blood test and getting a workup in a panel and um, so kind of. One of the things I would like to say with that is I started my career way back, way back, way back, looking at um, the mechanism of um, my, my dissertation. I mean, this is how long ago this was like a long time ago, um, was looking at stress during pregnancy and attention deficit disorder in kids after they're born. Um, so looking at basically um, programming of babies in utero before they're born. Um, and so that was one of those things where it's like looking toward that mechanism and I didn't have the capacity to test the mechanism, but I made the proposal. Other people over the years did test the mechanism to look and see is this happening? And yes, it, it was happening, but um, the precise mechanism we could try to get at. But what, what I decided was more important was if you reduced the stress during pregnancy and fewer of the kiddos had attention deficit disorder, you didn't really have to know exactly how it happened in your body. And that's the that's sort of the, the perspective that we've taken on this is if indeed we think this connection is reducing, is going to reduce the need for drugs and and help people not to be um, um, addicted, then we were we do that connecting, and the use goes down. Then we don't have to know what that was, and so we don't have to do the testing. And maybe it was the endogenous opioids opioid system, and maybe somebody goes off and, and tests that mechanism. But I'm more interested in using say a a a thing that seems good anyway regardless because you're not you're not you don't have to go to a pharmacy for human connection and things like that so, so it's it's like it, it it is a thing that seems like it would be good anyway and if it has the required or the desired result then we can assume mechanism without proving mechanism we're still we're making things better so that's kind of the 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 way i have approached it um, but yeah, I would love to know if that's how it's doing. But but it seems to help the selling of the whole thing to say there's a scientific link in there, a physiological link that's happening. And I think there is. I just don't know that we'll be able to nail down exactly how it's working. But I hope somebody. I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, you'd mentioned about adversity, but I don't think that I heard you say, or I missed it, that the you know we know the adversity affects brain development. <laughs> Do we know whether adversity cortisol excess cortisol production does that does that disrupt the endogenous opiate opioid system i assume i assume so and what what um i wrote an article on this that is actually under review right now which i would hopefully eventually be able to share with all of you but um what i said in the article even was i'm going to talk about the endogenous opioid system but we know that we are far more complex with that than that and every one of those systems is talking to every one of those other systems. And so, because I started out, HPA axis is what I studied when I was looking at the prenatal programming, you know. And so we know that those are interplaying and toxic stress is, I'm sure, affecting that endogenous and opioid system and so forth. But I don't know how. I mean, that is, I hope there are people that are looking very closely at that um, because I know that they are affecting each other, but I don't know how. And I don't know if anybody has gone quite that deep and complex in their studies. Yeah, there actually are a couple of articles out there that talk about the HPA axis. So remember, that's our fight, flight, freeze system. It typically does downregulate our endogenous opioid system when that it's activated. Yeah. So it's like, we people are going into a lot of that like I need to protect myself things aren't like happy and I can't like really be excited to see my friends because I'm like worried about the bear around the corner and so that's a lot of what the emerging um, research has indicated is that there is a down regulation of those kind of happy feelings when you're in yes yeah. so I mean one of the things I think about is so the quit you know I study individual differences and so one of the things that I was wondering is 
if someone had a high ACE score, would they experience, you know, the first time they, they dabble with opioids, would they experience a different or much higher high than, than someone who didn't have a high ACE score just because they're, they're ready to launch into the stratosphere because their opioid system is so underused uh, right. because of all and their that ACEs. Is such that, is exactly, that is exactly what we're thinking, yes. Well, Andy, actually, there is an article that was published in 2022 in, I think they did this in England, and they basically had people do a test where they put their hands in cold water, oh, and right. they gave them a placebo of an opioid or an, a small dose of an opioid, and then they had people rate their pain, and then they had them like say whether or not they would want to use it again, like use the opioid to manage the like cold pain again. And people who had higher ACEs were like, absolutely sign me up. That was awesome. Like, give me more of that. And so what we do see kind of emerging in some early research is that people who do have that early childhood adversity, that opioid has this special like like a missing puzzle piece in their head. It like clicks in and it feels right and it feels normal. And it's something that kind of they want more of, at least according to this article. So, yeah. Yeah, it, because um, I know some people just don't like pain meds. They don't like them. It makes them sick. And other people love it. And, and I just, I'm wondering, is that a proxy for their ACE history? Maybe, maybe. Perhaps. I haven't run across anything like that. I think there's also... Um, some research about like first pass and second ma pass metabolism with opioids and people who it makes them sick. There's sometimes something with their stomach and not necessarily as much with their like brain chemistry with that. But I think that would be something that would be really cool to investigate. Yeah. Any other questions in our last couple of minutes? Question, comments? Yeah, please take the survey. Um, it's not working. The link's not oh. working. Then, um, so I'm not sure. But but what I would say is, if we can't get it, you know, working, we will send it out to everybody who's here because we really do want that that um, um, your feedback from that. Is this one? Yep, that one works. So thanks uh, everybody. Ben just put the new uh, link in. So if you could, it's just four questions um, and we really appreciate your thoughts. Hey, I got a new project for you, Andy, because um, so I have a need, you know, I do foster care uh, work and um, kids who are even at risk of custody or coming into custody with a lot of families, obviously, when you say 60 percent, you know, like that, that's the population. And one of the gaps in human connection that we see are mentors, adults who could do what you're kind of saying with this. Um, in in years and years and years ago, um, the our Tennessee, the state funded a whole mentor project, um, you know, where there was people that, you know, could volunteer, they could be trained, kind of like what you're doing with, with this driving. So if you need an idea for another project to yep. look at human connection that's preventative with kids, I got the idea. I think, um, I think, that's, I think that's amazing. I think it's wonderful. We, I mean, we know Big Brothers Big Sisters is one of the best prevention things for for all kinds of later problems, um, but yeah, and I think that those those populations overlap so much, so much. Um, so yeah, the the mentoring with the with the kids in care or needing to go in care, mentoring of the whole family. That that's one of the things. There's the new um, the um, Strong Families Tennessee project is there are family navigators that help whole families to address whatever's going on and I think all of all of it has to work together because it, it is all the same problems and the same same you know they're all related to addiction they're related to ACEs and they're so overlapped that you can't even talk about one without talking about the other yeah and 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 yeah now our I mean there 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 are places in Virginia I can't even remember in Mary Jo but it was like 40% of the kids in the county were in foster care. So I don't know if it was quite that high, but it was a ridiculously high number of kids. And, and yeah, a lot of the work, I'll plug myself just really quick. A lot of the work that I do with the Virginia Rural Health Association is helping do hair follicle testing for kiddos that are entering the foster care system. 
so that we can have more information about what substances they may be withdrawing from as they're coming from a substance exposed environment. And what we're seeing is crazy, like adult male level doses of substances in these kiddos systems when they're entering the foster care system. And then they're experiencing withdrawal and behaviors that can't be explained or understood. And just this kind of, if we're looking at it from a developmental perspective, they've already been introduced to that substance. And how important is it to have that mentor, that person to connect with them, that one person that's I always tell the people that I train is I'm like, the best thing you can do is be boring and be consistent and show up lovingly. Like that's, that's, that's the best thing you can possibly do. Um, and I think that as we continue to like shine more light on this, this issue, we'll, we'll try to get back to social connection. <laughs> Cause I think we've all kind of forgotten how to do that. Um, but yeah. Andy, someone wants to know how they can follow your research. Oh, follow my research. Um, I'm I'm Clements at etsu.edu. That's probably the easiest way. And then I can just send you to whichever part of it you're interested in. <laughs> and our um the uplift site is upliftappalachia.org. Um, I'm at the Strong Brain Institute, I'm at ETSU, so all any of those places. Um, yeah. And I will talk to anybody anywhere, anytime. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mary Jo. Thank you, Andy. This was really, really interesting presentation. So excited about the work that you're bringing to fill in that, that transportation gap, which is really making it a part of the treatment, not just that you can't get there, but that is a part of the treatment. So thank you very much for your talk. Thanks, everyone, for being here and filling out the feedback. And I hope you can join us in April um, with our next resilience presentation.